streaming live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, Nash syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, welcome into the program. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are doing computer and technology news for the show, and we have a lot of different topics to talk about. Everything from uh, poor passwords, cybersecurity, uh, to Bitcoin and just how much of an electricity monster that whole project is. Uh, you know, some space stuff, some phone stuff, and all that kind of thing. So with that being said, everyone, welcome into the program once again, uh, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything that you need to know, including past shows, future shows, all the shows. Uh, I know that it's a little bit behind date, but that's going to be okay. Uh, over at our website, you can also find our content, well, not contest, our giveaway, where we are giving away hundreds of dollars in prizes. And hey, it's completely free to enter. We highly encourage you to do that. And it's our way of saying thank you for joining us for 30 years. And we're looking forward to at least another 30 years here with you. Now, with that being said, everyone, again, welcome into the program. Let's go ahead and get started with computer and technology news. And that's, of course, brought to you by Computer America. Here we go. All right, let's go ahead and, um, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about, let's see, yeah, and by the way, still looking up stories as we speak, but I think one of the first things that we can do is something hopeful, and, you know, it doesn't really matter where it's from, this is a great feat for, uh, really for humanity, and with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about this. Ladies and gentlemen, the uncrewed Chinese spacecraft Tianwen-1 successfully enters Mars orbit, which is great. You know, hey, uh, for a long time, NASA was the only one to make it to Mars. Uh, and I know that a couple of different uh, vehicles in the past couple of years have made it there, including Indian, Chinese, um, the U.S., as well as I think a few other ones. But hey, exploration of our closest neighboring planet is always exciting. Now, an uncrewed spacecraft on Wednesday successfully en entered orbit around Mars after a six and a half month journey from Earth. Chinese space agency said in the country's first independent mission on the Red Planet, the robotic probe carried out a 15 minute burn of its thrusters uh, and the China National Space Administration said in a statement, slowing the spacecraft to a speed at which it was captured by the pull of Mars gravity. Now, in May or June, the Tianwen-1 will attempt to land a capsule uh, carrying a 240 kilogram, which my conversion is really bad, but about 500 pounds. A 500 pound rover in a rapid seven minute descent onto a massive plane in the northern hemisphere of Mars. Now, if the landing is successful, the solar powered rover will explore the Martian surface for 90 days, studying, uh, yeah, studying its soil and seeking signs of ancient life, including any subsurface water, which I guess is a big one. And uh, yeah, with that being said, um, Let's see. It's, 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 it's. Yeah. With that being said, the uh, the probe is one of three reaching Mars this month. The Hope spacecraft launched by the United Arab Emirates. I forgot that they were getting into the space race too. Uh, successfully entered the planet's orbit on Tuesday. Hope will not make its landing, but will orbit Mars, gathering data on its weather and atmosphere. Tianwen one will also have an orbiter component surveying the Martian atmosphere. And the two probes joined six other orbiting spacecraft with the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, obviously NASA and the European Space Agency and India. So uh, China, United Arab Emirates, uh, the US, Europe and India. It's five now. Very impressive. 
Now, with that being said, the United States' most ambitious Mars mission, the One Ton Perseverance Probe, is expected to arrive on February 18th, so just in a couple of days. Exciting time for space news. It will immediately attempt a landing on a rocky depression with uh, with precipitous cliffs called Jezero Crater. And with that being said, um, yeah, that is a very ambitious one. So the Chinese one is a 500 pound rover, and the U.S. one is a t- is a 2,000 pound rover. And of course, the difference in, t- in weight means a lot more scientific instruments, the uh, durability of it, and hey, just the ability to uh, go where other rovers have not been able to go before. And that's always exciting. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the day when we can finally send. Uh, people to Mars and you know it's not that far off so let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of these other ones um, okay how about this one and you know this is a little bit about politics but at the same time I don't know how he's going to do this so the headline caught my attention uh, there's a chip shortage going on I don't know if uh, if that's really been making the headlines oops I don't know if that's really been making the headlines here lately but um, yeah, it's been pretty big news. Where uh, let's see, it's, yeah, uh, this one. So where did yeah, there we go. Yeah, this one making the headlines a lot. Where it's one of those things that uh, cars aren't able to be manufactured. Smart cars, self-driving cars, and even just regular ordinary cars aren't able to be manufactured. There's, of course, talk of uh, shortages and delays on uh, you know everything from computers, laptops, cell phones. Uh, there's a massive sh- supply shortage when it comes to chips. And this is, you know, this is pretty, uh, you know, pretty interesting considering the fact that, you know, uh, one of the only American producers of chips, being Intel, just so recently talked about the, uh, you know, just so recently talked about the lack of, well, I guess, need to manufacture here in the U.S. Uh, They were thinking about sending it completely into the existing uh, supply chain and scrapping their in-house production. So, a story like this really catches, uh, you know, again, really catches your attention where, you know, we were talking about, hey, maybe we should, you know, not be doing this or stop doing this altogether. And then at the same time saying, hey, you know, now our president is saying we need to be doing this all the more. So the Biden administration is planning aggressive steps to alleviate the global semiconductor shortage, saying that the chip shortage has impacted the auto industry and contributed to the scarcity of next-gen gaming consoles. Now, President Biden is expected to sign an executive order directing a government-wide supply chain review for critical goods in the coming weeks, with the chip shortage a central concern behind the probe. And they're saying they want to identify choke points in the supply chains to each ease the current shortages. So nothing too much yet. Essentially, assign a committee to look into to figure out why this is happening. In the longer term, the White House may also create new incentives to bring chip manufacturing back into America. The top executives of chip makers, in, uh, including Intel and Qualcomm, have urged the Biden administration to fund such initiatives, though it's not clear exactly for what. And I got to say, Qualcomm, uh, I don't have too much of a problem with Qualcomm, though if uh, if Foxconn ever gets into the deal saying that, you know, we want to produce here in the U.S., we want incentives, uh, man, I just think back to the factory in, uh, in like Utah or something like that, where uh, Foxconn said they were going to build a big TV manufacturing plant and they were going to assemble everything and bring, you know, tens of thousands of jobs to the area. And they were given so many tax incentives and tax breaks, uh, that, you know, it really almost offset any kind of economic activity that could have happened there. And then lo and behold, they pulled out, uh, you know, and didn't even do that. So, Intel, I think can do it. Uh, they're still, you know, made in America and one of the only chip production facilities here in the United States. Uh, Qualcomm, I guess, would be okay. You know, uh, they are already in so many different products. And, I, you know, hey, Computer America, we uh, definitely fancy things being built in here. Because, again, if Intel were to have shuttered its manufacturing uh, 
processes. And don't get me wrong, like if you watch their stock, Intel said that they were considering it. You know, they got that letter from the uh, big investor that was, you know, uh, demanded change in leadership, which they got. They said, you know, you need to consider uh, piggybacking on everyone else's work. Uh, stop trying to manufacture your own chips and uh, sell out to uh, T- TMSC and a bunch of these other chip manufacturers. And Obviously, the marketers and you know uh, the market, their stock price went up, saying that they were going to consider it. But then, go on to find out that uh, yeah, it actually did not happen. They said they they were committed to you know uh, really keeping their manufacturing part of their business intact. And their stock price went down. Manufacturers didn't, or uh, the you know uh, the market didn't like that. But I think it was much needed because at that point it's almost a monopoly and it's a monopoly that would definitely hurt the u.s seeing as how it's not something that the u.s can really control it's parts made in taiwan south korea china um, places like that and hey that's um very much not in our neighborhood and very much open to influences from the likes of china and other parts of the world so i'm, I'm happy that they're looking into this and yeah let's uh Let's go ahead and just uh, say that. So I don't know what an executive action can do. It's going to take a lot of economic incentive. Right now, there's a lot more incentive to keep these things offshore or to offshore these things even more. But hey, it's uh, you know pretty uh, pretty surprising that they take these steps to you know really take notice that there is is this shortage. And there you go. Okay, so our next story, story number three that we're going to go ahead and talk about. A nice little fun one, again, from Engadget, and I thought this was too cute to pass up. So, uh, yeah, I'm a fan of dogs. Dogs are pretty great, uh, as you can see on the video portion. But researchers built an AI that recognizes and rewards good dogs, saying that the team trained NVIDIA Jetson Edge AI to use more than 20,000 images of dogs. And, you know, they have a short little video here, which, yep, we should be good to go. We can kind of play here in the background as we go. And, yeah, this is an example of, you know, the dog sitting there uh, being an attentive dog. And then, of course, the uh, the little machine there on the edge of the counter or desk recognizes that the dog is sitting intentively and or uh, sitting and looking intently at its owner and then spits out a couple of treats. Seems simple to a human, but to a computer, to be able to recognize not just what a dog is, but the different positions of a dog, it's pretty cool. Now, both are now both of the researchers are computer science grad students, used NVIDIA's Jetson Edge AI to create the system. They trained it using more than 20,000 labeled images of dogs in various positions, saying that their willing to volunteer, uh, I'm sorry, their willing volunteer was uh, one of their pets. Using a camera, the system was able to analyze Henry's position in a split second. It had up to 92% test accuracy at around 39 frames per second. Now, the researchers suggest that dog training and owners could use the system as a teaching aid, so you might be able to train your dog, uh, your very good dog, remotely when you want to get back to the office. I gotta say, though, that, you know, from training dogs, one of the things about dogs is that you want to reward the behavior, and by the way, this is, you know, almost nothing to do with computers, but anyways, you want to reward the behavior as fast as possible. That's why, uh, uh, clicking training is is so important is that instead of like distracting the dog pulling them away from whatever it is that you like that they're doing to feed them a treat you do the clicker and you get that sense of immediate reward because the dog knows that the treat is coming so you know whenever the dog sits you click it and they know that the act of sitting is what triggered the reward it's not just a random you know here's a treat it's uh, you know that that the the immediateness or the the expediency of what it is. I don't think in, uh, immediate is even a word, but yeah, the ability to really pinpoint exactly when the dog did something correct that is the important part. And I think an AI uh, 
you know, an AI trainer in certain situations. I mean, we still train dogs to do all kinds of jobs all over the world. Uh, something like this, you could see could have some benefits. I don't think it will ever, ever replace a human because even though the AI and the machines would be very intent and intensely focused on the dog to make sure the dog is doing things, I think getting a dog to pay attention to a machine would be much, much harder to do. Because, let's face it, they're very much bonded to humans. Uh, so, yeah, it's very cool, and I definitely appreciate how they... Uh, you know, how they're trying to apply this. Obviously, this is a grad student project, and yeah, there you go. Worked out well for that dog, and I'm sure just knowing that you can sit in front of this machine and get some free food, not a bad trade, not a bad trade at all. Now, uh, the next story, this is a follow-up to a story that we did like uh, two days ago or yesterday, I think yesterday. Uh, yeah, this was a story that we did yesterday. Uh, Cyberpunk in the Witcher Studio, uh, CD Projekt Red, unfortunately was the victim of a cyber attack. They've confirmed it. It's, you know, yeah, that is not in question. But the question is, what happens now? And it looks like from the, uh, you know, there were threats from the nefarious actor saying that, hey, uh, we're going to sell your source code for two of your biggest games, uh, including The Witcher and, uh, well, let's see, The Witcher 3, and that includes the uh, the updated version that came with, uh, you know, that was supposed to come out in a couple of months with the next-gen console, as well as uh, Cyberpunk 2077, two of the biggest games that have released in the past decade, and now their source code is out there floating around in the hands of someone who is more than willing to sell it. Now, to be clear, no one is going to buy it that is a reputable company. It's not like a com you know, it's not like uh, Coke's going to buy Pepsi's secret or Pepsi's going to buy Coke's secret. No, this is going to be someone who's going to potentially uh, take it, dis uh, distribute illegal copies, and try to make their money back on the back end. And yeah, you know, I don't know many people who are willing to do that for a million dollars, but it does kind of scare. Uh, CD Projekt Red because anyone can take that code and compile it and make the full-fledged video game. And if that source code ever got out there, then you can be sure there would be the actual game floating out there completely, you know, no holds bar. Uh, very, very bad and could hurt their bottom line. They're hoping that the million dollar ransom is paid by CD Projekt Red to stop them from losing even more money. So there you go. Okay, now, with that being said, though, what happens next is really up to uh, is really up to the hackers because they can get the million dollars that they're asking for, and at the same time, yeah, it's uh, not going to be good. Now, they said that uh, the breach, which CD Projekt Red first disclosed ye yesterday after learning of it on Monday, involved critical game code related to The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077. Now... That said, they have no intention of meeting the hacker's demands, even if it meant stolen material from the hack began circulating online. That has now started to happen, it appears. Earlier today, leaks of potentially legitimate source code information started appearing on online forums. And there you go. Now, the initial leak is believed to include the source code for the virtual card game Gwent, while VX Underground disclosed that auctions for more valuable source code uh, were happening on a hacking form known as Exploit. And they said that they haven't been able to verify the information and they have not responded for a request to comment. But a cybersecurity firm, which specializes in providing threat intelligence to companies based on analysis of dark web websites, uh, and community says it has reason to believe that they are legitimate, saying, quote, we do believe that there is a real auction by a real seller who has access to the data. The seller offers uh, offers to use a guarantor, and he allows only those who have a deposit to, to participate, a tactic that is used by many sellers to show that they are serious and to ensure that no scam will occur. You can be sure that when something like this and something as high profile and as big as something like this happens, uh, there's going to be law enforcement. 
among the people who are bidding on this project. And I don't see this ending well for the hackers at any point. But they say that uh, uh, one, one of its analysts were able to download some of the information provided to him by an individual claiming to be involved in the auctions. And they mentioned that uh, the file list allegedly showing off stolen source code of the engine, which if you're watching the video portion, you can see the source code here. And it has everything from root, red engine, all the way down to uh, you know data, gameplay, GUI, icons, inventory, and a bunch of different uh, code that all begins with root, which is about as basic as you get. Now, they say that the auction is offering source code files for both Red Engine and CD Projekt Red releases, including The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Thronebreaker, The, Witches, the Witcher Tales spinoff, and of course, Cyberpunk 2077. And they say that uh, the starting price was 1 million with higher bids and increments of 500,000 and a buy it now price of $7 million. Only users with deposit of 0.1 Bitcoin can participate and they believe the hackers are serious about hosting the auction and that the material for sale is likely legitimate because it ensures nobody participating in the auction is trying to scam the sellers. Trying to scam, probably not. Trying to catch them, a whole nother thing. Now, with that being said, it's not clear whether the leak uh, from earlier today is any is in any way associated with uh, the ransomware attack. But yeah, these kinds of things are going to happen. Uh, I don't know what the best course of action for Cyberpunk is. I mean, odds are the best course is to let law enforcement take care of it. But by that time, their game engine, essentially the thing that makes all of CG Project Red's games look like their games, uh, is going is probably at this point going to be leaked. Uh, there's conversations going on about how this happened and how they recover from it. Uh, this is this would be pretty easy to recover from because uh, you know. Fortunately, unfortunately, these video games have already, you know, kind of had their debut. They've already been released. And uh, aside from like anniversary editions and things like that, um, they've made their money in, you know, they probably made the majority of their money they were going to make from these games. Uh, I'm sure that they wish this wouldn't have happened, but the studio is definitely going to recover from this. Uh it's just a shame. And, and like I said yesterday, the people doing this are really, really horrible people. So, so there you go. That was story number four. Story number five has to do with Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, back in the news, uh, I might have to do another story about this. But let's see, what is the price of Bitcoin? I keep reading it surges and it falls. It surges and it falls. Uh, the price of Bitcoin currently forty-seven thousand dollars. At one point, uh, let's see, the one day, the intraday here, touching to about forty-eight thousand six hundred, I believe was the high, and I think even before that, yeah, that seems to be the new high. So set a new record today alone. And yeah, 46,800 seems to be kind of the top. Uh, the charts kind of speak for themselves. And, you know, there was the big bump where everyone really got uh, really got interested in Bitcoin at $20,000. It, of course, cratered and fell back down to like 3000 And now it has, even though there was like a bump in the middle there, what went up to 10000 it has been skyrocketing. Like it quadrupled in price in the past three months. People are paying attention to it again. Now, people are also paying attention to the unfortunate side effects of Bitcoin. And we've talked about the Bitcoin, mining for Bitcoin. It's this process where your computer handles very complex computations. Uh, the I'm sorry, the uh, uh, some of it is for maintaining its own blockchain and maintaining its own essentially online ledger that verifies transactions. Uh, some of the mining, though, is time gated and work gated behind large computational um, uh, equations that it has to solve and problems that it has to solve so that it can spit out a Bitcoin. 
This is a couple of reasons to limit the supply of Bitcoin, but also give people a way to be able to mine it, make sure that it only happens with uh, you know the proper hardware, so on and so forth. Well, the verifying that the Bitcoin, uh, verifying all the transactions and mining for Bitcoin, it's pretty power hungry. It's uh, it's pretty all consuming. And to put this into perspective, looks like, well, it's just past Argentina in terms of the amount of electricity used in a year, I think in a, yeah, uh, a yearly basis. And by the way, it's only increasing. So check this out. Mining for the cryptocurrency is power hungry, involving heavy computer calculations to verify transactions. Critics say electric car from Tesla decision to invest heavily in Bitcoin under, undermines its environmental image. Now, the, the cryptocurrency's value hits $48,000 this week following Tesla's announcement that it had purchased $1.5 billion, but the rising price offers even more incentive to Bitcoin miners to run more and more machines. Saying that it is really hard, I'm sorry, it is really by design that Bitcoin consumes that much electricity. This is not something that we will change in the future unless the Bitcoin price is going to go down significantly. And that's very important because, you know, the original creators of Bitcoin, um, they never really cared about the environmental impact of Bitcoin. Uh, they saw it as a way to limit the production of Bitcoin, the mining of Bitcoin, and the electricity side of it, you know, when something is worth 0. 0.000001 cent uh, for each coin, it's not that, you know, it's not really that big a deal. But when you have so much, so many transactions going on and the price of these things is so high and the demand is so high, and again, there's fractions of transactions happening every single second, um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, um, those ledgers are going to get very complicated and very, very uh, long and arduous. Enter the problem that we have today, where, let's face it, you know, clean energy is still a little ways off, and a lot of countries are having to support this. Now, the online tool, uh, so this online tool that we have here, if you're looking at the video portion, you can see the chart right here. Uh, to be clear, compared to, the, to China and the United States, uh, electricity consumption still a distant, distant way off. But if Bitcoin was a country, it would definitely be in the top 30, somewhere around half the uh, yeah half the power consumption of let's say Mexico, more than Argentina, just behind Norway, and I'm sure it will be overtaking a number of those countries here in the following year. Now, with that being said. Um, the article gets into a bit, you know, a bit more about what is mining Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but Bitcoin is literally anti-efficient. So more efficient, uh, so more efficient mining hardware won't help. Uh, you'll just be competing against other efficient mining hardware. This means that Bitcoin energy use and hence CO2 production only spiral only spirals outward. It's very bad that all this energy is being literally wasted in a lottery. And that's something that other blockchains and other cryptocurrencies have tried to address. There are ways that you don't need to spend this much electricity to be able to mine for cryptocurrency. Uh, the problem is Bitcoin is Bitcoin and it's out there. It's not going to be revoked and changing the actual uh, underpinnings of Bitcoin is not something that is done easily because there's so many involved actors. Uh, there's no central location that says, oh yeah, we're patching Bitcoin. It's going to be great. No, it, it literally involves the entire community to agree to a consensus and then change that. If you want to read more about that, you can check out Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and how hard it is to make underlying fundamental changes that by all accounts are good for the system. But that doesn't mean that they'll be adopted. Now, uh, they say that it's uh, 
the price of Bitcoin rose rapidly after Tesla announced its investment. Tesla, and of course, saying that it turned around and spent $1.5 billion in Bitcoin, which is mostly mined using electricity from coal. Their subsidies need to be examined. Now, a carbon tax on cryptocurrency could be introduced to balance out some of the negative consumption. But, yeah, trying to... Uh, yeah, trying to balance out uh, what's happening with Bitcoin with uh, taxes and things like that. It's uh, it's definitely going to be hard. So now, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, continue our talk here. Our next story. <laughs> our next story we can do is how about. This one. So this is an update to a story that we are paying attention to pretty closely. It had to do with TikTok. Obviously, the Trump administration uh, gave TikTok some very hard, um, yeah, gay gave some very hard guidelines on TikTok and about the sale of TikTok, the ownership of TikTok, and you know to prevent uh, data mining of U.S. citizens by the Chinese government, uh, they said that the uh, the Chinese-owned company had to be sold to a third party. And in a lot of cases, that was, you know, Oracle Walmart, I believe, went in surprisingly on a deal together, trying to put a bid in. Uh, Microsoft, if you recall, was in talks to purchase the purchase the entity, although that backed out and that didn't happen. Uh, there were a lot of suitors and not a lot of time to actually, you know, kind of, uh, not a lot of time to actually make deals. Of course, that timeline shifted a lot. At certain points, it was just a week away. Um, and then as soon as the time came, they were like, oh yeah, you have two more months, you have a month more. Uh, it was very, very sloppy how it was being held. Well, we have a bit of, of an update, saying that the uh, saying that uh, the firm have the firms have not co commented, but any postponement could signal a softer approach towards China tech giants from the new Biden administration. Oracle and Walmart have been in talks with TikTok since September to finalize the deal. Uh, both Wall Street Journal and Reuters are reporting that the deal could be shelved, although none of the companies involved have commented. Reuters reports that the new Biden administration will conduct wide-ranging review of Trump's China policy, and that could take months. But one of them is that he puts the uh, the ban of TikTok on hold, so they can continue to operate here in the U.S. while they figure this whole thing out. They said that on Wednesday, the U.S. Justice Department asked two courts to pause challenges it had been pursuing against rulings that were blocking Trump administration restrictions being imposed on TikTok. So there you go. Uh, industry watchers think that it may ultimately adopt a softer tone towards China and could overturn the decision to sell off the viral video platform in the U.S., in, the, in this game of high-stakes poker, it's very possible that the TikTok sale ultimately never happens, depending on U.S. policy that would be a seminal shift for the U.S. towards China in technology policy and send an olive branch signal to Beijing. However, he mentions that it might still make sense for TikTok to pursue the deal. ByteDance and its board might decide to go ahead with the deal, uh, uh, once it goes through a White House and and committee review and eliminate any lingering security concerns for the TikTok platform. And I got to kind of agree with that, where uh, obviously the concerns with TikTok are still there. You know, the issues that Trump raised were completely were completely legitimate. A lot of the data being captured through TikTok, and there was a lot of data points being captured in a lot of cases on kids and young kids, even under 13, and being stored overseas on Chinese servers ready to be taken at any time. Uh, those, cons those security concerns still exist. How they address it might ultimately be selling the company to a third party. Uh, whether or not they get the right price, they might be able to come to some kind of better agreement now that there is, oh, how do you say this? Now that there's more time and there isn't this looming sword of Damocles over them, they're able to, uh, 
yeah, you know, hey, they're able to actually hash out a decent deal. So we'll see what actually comes of that. Uh, yeah, now, so with that being said, I think that the timelines that they were giving were pretty unreasonable and the whole thing should probably still happen to some extent, but, uh, you know, from a security standpoint, but hey, at least it's, um, yeah, at least it's, uh, taking another stab at it. Now, let's go ahead and let's see, let's see, let's see. So looking through these different stories here, let's see. How about, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so you know, little stories like this, HBO Max will be available outside the United States uh, starting in uh, June. So if you're not here in the U.S., just, you know, obviously uh, not really our purview, but uh, Mexico, Brazil, Haiti, Jamaica, Venezuela, other parts of Central and South America will have access to HBO Max. Uh, they will be phasing out their HBO Go service, but they will be able to get instant access through Max. And the great thing about that is obviously the uh, the link the linking with uh, Warner Media and all of the movies that you can't see in theaters are going to be instantly available on HBO Max. So a little bit of an expansion from that one. Uh, let's see. So there's that. Let's go ahead and continue on here. So some of the other stories, I mean, uh, we're actually going to not talk about that one. How about this? Story number eight. Breached water plant employees use the same team viewer password and no firewall. And this is just another example of really uh, be careful because someone's going to be your weakest link. And there are some very simple steps that they could do to make sure that this didn't happen. But I have a feeling this is like most workplaces that people work in. Uh, security and lack of security uh uh, procedures and following them is going to get a lot of people in trouble. So, yep, breach water facility. And, and by the way, uh, due to the recent uh, ransomware attacks and other uh, hacks that we've seen, infrastructure is going to be a huge target in the next decade as we start to sure up these things, get them more digitized, but at the same time, we don't really, you know, invest in cybersecurity. That's why we've seen like school boards, school systems, uh, entire school districts uh, get attacked, as well as, you know, kind of local city, state government uh, facilities also get attacked. It's something that's going to get worse and worse. And this is just another example of it. Now, this computer intrusion, and by the way, this happened in Florida, uh, happened because there was no firewall, they had a shared team viewer password among its employees. Government officials have reported. Now, this happened in in Oldsmar, a Florida city of about fifteen thousand. That's roughly fifteen miles northwest of Tampa. After gaining remote access to a computer that controlled equipment inside the Oldsmar water treatment plant, the unknown intruder increased the amount of sodium hydroxide, a caustic chemical known as lye, by a factor of one hundred. The tampering could have caused severe sickness or death had it not been for a safeguard the city had in place. That's scary. And honestly, the uh, you know the headline kind of undersells it. Uh, that's huge news that they were able to not just gain access to their systems and you know potentially sat in on meetings and stolen data, but it actually caused real world harm and could have actually killed people doing this. Uh, according to an advisory from the state of Massachusetts, employees in the old Smar uh, facility used a computer running Windows 7 to remotely access plant controls known as SCADA, a sh uh, short for supervisory control and data acquisition system What's more, the computer had no firewall installed and used a password that was shared among employees for remotely logging into city systems with the team viewer application. Now, the Massachusetts officials wrote saying that 
the unidentified actor accessed the treatment plant. All computers used by the water plant personnel were connected to the SCADA system and used the 32-bit version of the Windows 7 operating system. Furthermore, all computers shared the same password for remote access and appeared to be connected directly to the internet with no firewall protection. Yeah, the FBI did their own investigation and found the exact same thing. Now, uh, with that being said, obviously the lack of security rigor found inside the facility is actually not uncommon and is found in many different critical infrastructure environments. Uh, using Windows 7, I mean, that's one of the biggest upgrades that we've had in a long time, was that instead of the systems using Windows XP uh, or Windows 95 in a lot of cases, no, now they use Windows 7. Windows 7, of course, being old hat, uh, coming out, I want to say back in like 2012 or 2013. Even that is almost a decade old at this point. Not something you really want to... Uh, you know, you really want to do. Now, the person on the other end changed the amount of lye added to the water from about one part per million to 11,100 parts per million. Lye is used in small amounts to adjust drinking water, uh, the acidity, and remove metals and other contaminants. In larger doses, it's it can be deadly. Um... Now, on Wednesday, they said that the breach was very likely the work of a disgruntled employee, and the city officials said residents were never in danger because they the change was quickly reversed. But still, very dangerous. And a disgruntled employee, I think that happens, you know, uh, almost like an inside uh, an insider threat, but not actually because you know they were they were an insider at one point. But there you go. Okay. Now, with that being said, um, let's go ahead and continue on here. And <laughs> how about we talk? Um, okay, how about we talk about um, another ban? And I think Twitter did this, Instagram did this as well. Uh, just another example of, you know, kind of the tech industry wading into uh, what shouldn't be politics, which are just, you know, kind of science and facts and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and just uh, and call this one out. So Instagram bans top anti-vaxxer Robert F. Kennedy Jr. over the COVID falsehoods. Uh, a, Fis a Facebook spokesperson also told ours that uh, Kennedy's Instagram account was removed for repeatedly sharing debunked claims about the coronavirus and vaccines, and they had over 800,000 followers prior to its removal. Uh, they said that uh, the social media behemoth told the New York Times it has no plans to remove Kennedy from Facebook at this time. Hmm. Um, yeah, there you go. And I believe... Um, Let's see, there was that one, and I believe there's also one about Twitter doing the exact same thing. The point is, social media is starting to take control of their platforms, which I believe is anticipation of changes to Section 230, and, you know, really what that can mean. So, okay, there's that one. Um, hmm, hmm. Let's go ahead and continue on here, some of these other stories. Hmm. How about, okay, this one, NVIDIA. Because of the global chip shortage that we mentioned earlier, it looks like NVIDIA is trying to bring back its old RTX 2060 and GTX 1050 Ti GPUs to deal with the global chip shortage, saying that the lower end cards are older, but at least could help satisfy some of the video card demand saying that PC World has confirmed that NVIDIA is planning to release stock of GTX 1050 Ti and RTX 2060 GPUs to its board uh, partners in an attempt to deal with stock shortages and sky-high prices of the new 30 series cards. At the moment, it's not just new cards that people are having trouble getting their hands on, it's all modern graphics cards. Now, the GTX 1050 Ti cost about 140 when it launched in October 2016, but when the author went to go looking for them on Newegg and Amazon, they found them uh, off the shelf. Uh, one model uh, in stock, which was selling for about 
50 bucks more, $190, and third-party sellers were asking 250, 340, and even more for them. Uh, if the 1050 Ti's price scares you, you might want to look what they found for the RTX 2060s, which launched in 2019 for about 350. Some of them going all the way up to $1,700, and the majority of them being about you know $700. You know, and so twice the price for a decent, you know, for a recent-ish card in the past two years, twice the price, and then you have other ones from five years ago going for about 40% higher than the, than what they were back then. Hopefully, as the author writes, NVIDIA releasing the new stock will help bring the prices down, especially since it seems like new cards won't be easy to get anytime soon. There's been a global shortage of chips affecting everything from laptops to trucks, as we said, and some saying that the industry is even having trouble producing chips that aren't state-of-the-art. The situation has gotten to the point where President Biden, obviously, we talked about, uh, is looking into saying saying that he could start by taking a look at the 25% tariff that Trump put on graphics cards. For now, your best bet is to keep an eye out for the GTX uh, 1050 Ti and RTX 2060 to see if they go down. And of course, as always, you can wait for the 30 series NVIDIA graphics cards that are out there. But it's... Uh, it's tough out there if you're in the market for a graphics card. No one is looking to sell them, and uh, yeah, uh, the people who are looking to sell them are simply scalpers. Not good. Not good. Um, <laughs> so with that being said, uh, continuing on here, and uh, really, okay, a little more pop culture here for you. I was actually a huge fan of The Mandalorian, and you know, it, it, uh, of all the TV shows that I've seen in the past couple of years, it was the only one. Like, I just don't really follow TV series, but I found that one really enjoyable. It was fun, and I'm surprised that one of its stars looks like won't be, uh, you know, won't be continuing her role. Saying that uh, Disney has severed ties with Gina Car uh, Carano, who played Cara Dune in The Mandalorian, the company announced on Wednesday, saying that they are currently not employed by Lucasfilms and no plans for her to be so in the future. Uh, Carano has recently come under scrutiny for several posts published on social media, including anti-Semitic posts on her Instagram. Some of the content from Carano's tweets are captured in screenshots seen below. And Lucasfilm spokesperson said that her social media posts uh, denigrating people based on their cultural and religious identities are abhorrent and uh, and are unacceptable. And looking at some of these uh, tweets here, um, yeah, it's uh, let's see, uh, do 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 do. Yeah, a lot of these are just. You know, it's one thing to be, um, it, it, you know, it's one thing to have a different opinion than others, but I don't know what it is about, I can only say it's the quarantine, people are getting completely uh, stir crazy, they're seeing things, they're not really thinking, they're just hitting retweet, relike, you know, whatever, they're sharing things, and man, they just don't really rub two brain cells together. It seems like such an easy thing not to post stuff like this. Uh, this isn't the first time Corona has been uh, criticized for posts on social media. In September, she lists her pronouns as beep, bop, and boop on her Twitter bio, which was condemned for being transphobic. And of course, she removed them uh, after a conversation with her co-star. But still, it's... Uh, you know, it's one thing to be edgy and clever and witty and that kind of thing, but man, you don't have to be, though. You don't have to be. Okay, how about something a little more lighthearted than that? For those of you who know about Borderlands, Borderlands is coming out with a movie. Looks like that's still on. And one of the best casting decisions I think the Borderlands movie could have ever had involves Jack Black. He will play the snarky robot Claptrap, in the Borderlands movie, saying Jack Black is set to play snarky robot Claptrap in the upcoming Borderlands movie. 
And he joins uh, what's turning out to be an all-star cast, including Jamie Lee Curtis, Kevin Hart, and Kate Blanchett. The movie will be directed by Eli Roth, who's most recent direct, uh, who most recently directed The House with a Clock in Its Walls. Uh, they both starred in, you know, some of the other sto- uh, stars star in the movie. And yeah, uh, obviously Claptrap is the funniest character in the game, and Jack is perfect to bring that to the big screen. Uh, if you ask me, Black's wild exuberance is a perfect match for the robot's quippy in-game persona. If you haven't seen the game before, this article has a link to a video of some of the best lines. But safe to say that it's a serious kind of dystopian future in Borderlands, where it's very violent and very harsh. But at the same time, there's a lot of humor, a lot of dark comedy, and let's face it, a lot of slapstick and a lot of, you know, just plainly humor humorous moments in the video games and i hope that the movie shows that you know it's uh it's a it's a civilization on the brink of collapse but at the same time it's uh you know there's still humor to be found in everything including even the uh pedestrian robots that inhabit the world now with that being said um uh, speaking, and of course, there's also the Last of Us movie, which uh, Pedro Bas- uh, Pascal, who plays the role in the Mandalorian, or, you know, the lead role in the Mandalorian, also signed on to play uh, uh, the uh, Joel in the Last of Us movie. So, video games are once again, hopefully, getting some good movie reboots, or at least. Uh, making i think there's also like a mortal Kombat movie that's being reintroduced so yeah good time to be good time to be in movies if you or good time to be interested in movies if you're into video games at any extent so so uh with that being said we have a couple of stories that we could i'm I'm sorry uh we have about 10 minutes left enough to do plenty of stories um a match I never really thought would actually happen. Post Malone. Literally might be the first time we've ever mentioned Post Malone here on the show. But, looks like he's holding a virtual concert, as is the way, uh, you know, so recently. A virtual concert to celebrate Pokemon's 25th anniversary. And... Here we go. Plus Malone is joining Pokemon's 25th anniversary with a virtual concert. The rapper will perform on February 27th in a digital event kicking off at 7 p.m. Eastern. On YouTube, the company released a teaser along with uh, along with the news, which includes a look at the very Pixar-ish animated version of the artist ahead of the performance. And if you're watching the video portion, uh, we'll play that here in the back, you know, in the background. So obviously, Post Malone has a very iconic look to him. You know, when I think about Pokemon and Nintendo, I think very clean. You know, uh, not much into piercing and tattoos and things like that. But at the same time, I think Post Malone is the opposite of that. Uh, great musician, though. So there you go. Uh, Post Malone there holding a Pokeball, and then suddenly, bam, turning into an animated version of himself, and the Post Malone concert. Uh, being hosted. So, there you go. Uh, The Pokemon Company International uh, announced P25, a series of musical events that will also include Katy Perry, will headline. Post Malone's concert will be a free event that they can tune into over the event's uh, official website, YouTube, or Twitch. The event is also expected to include more news on upcoming musical acts. In the absence of live events, you of course had Lil Nas X in Robot, uh, I'm sorry, in Roblox, and Travis Scott in Fortnite, and both of those uh, were very successful. I think by most accounts, you know, millions of people tuned in, uh, tuned into those, and having it free to access as opposed to some kind of like pay per view, uh, really led to just them going viral, you know, kind of as they were happening. And virtual concerts might become more of a thing, seeing as how popular they can definitely become. But yeah, a match I never thought. Post Malone and Pokemon. I would have never thought. So, um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, continue on our story here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So... Um, okay. 
how about we talk about hmm hmm <laughs> you know there there's one here about um really there's one here about pigs being able to play video games with their snouts i don't know if that's really what i'm kind of looking for here um yeah let's go ahead and switch on over to uh just one moment, and I apologize for any kind of background noise that you, you are able to hear, but there you go. Um, let's go ahead and, and talk about this one here, where we have a new broadband bill. And this applies to a lot of people out there that unfortunately don't have access to broadband at the moment. Hey, this could be for you. Uh, Representative James Clyburn signals return of a $100 billion broadband bill, it says that he has lined up support for return of Internet for All Act. And Majority Whip uh, Representative James Clyburn said Wednesday that he plans to reintroduce the Internet Accessibility Affordability Internet for All Act. And the uh, that came in a video session with the Policy Summit, and it's a hundred billion dollars. Boy, that money better to go to something useful because that is a lot of money for internet. Uh, and I know a bit about the the past that this country has had with uh, with funding internet through private companies, and that money has gone just into the ether like it is just a black hole that will just always continuously suck more money so there better be some either some harsh penalties for not meeting the actual deadlines but there also better be uh some municipal and support for local broadband as well as you know the national companies that we all know now he said that he had talked to everybody he needed to including the white house to make that investment in accessible and affordable broadband for all he relayed the story of a farmer in rural tennessee church he said brothers and sisters the greatest thing on earth is to have uh the love of god in your hearts and the next greatest thing is to have electricity in your house and then he said the new next greatest is broadband saying that he could speak out more freely given that his daughter former acting FCC chair, had decided not to get back into government, uh, he would weighed in on broadband mapping. He said that the notion that if one house in a census tract has access to broadband, then all homes uh, do can't continue to be the case. And that happened so often where, especially in you know parts of cities, you could have one house have access to internet. Therefore, that, you know, it was a pretty blank yes or no does this segment have access to broadband and it wasn't the majority of houses it was if one house does uh that really skewed the numbers and really hid the true extent of the digital divide between those who have broadband and those who don't uh he said and of course with that being said um yeah with yeah that this has a chance of reaching the floor and potentially being voted into, uh, yeah, you know, kind of uh, being made into law. There is a digital divide. I'm, I'm not so sure that throwing that kind of money at it is really all that necessary. I think that something like, you know, maybe satellite internet might actually come around and do the trick, but investment in in infrastructure is always a good thing especially when it comes to the internet so with that being said um with that being said our probably our last story that we're going to do involves um yeah the last one that we're going to do is about Twitter permanently suspending Project Veritas group. And I think I recall a little bit about Project Veritas. I'm not 1000% sure on what this was. Uh, suspended an account belonging to Project Veritas on Thursday, citing violations of the site's policies against publishing private information. And they said that the main Project Veritas account was permanently suspended, while the founder, James O'Keefe, had his account temporarily locked. 
Twitter did not return a request for comment. Uh, shared by Veritas and O'Keefe, founded in 2010, Project Veritas is a right-wing group that routinely published undercover Sting videos, some of which have been accused of, uh, of deceptive editing last October. Um, this, combined with the banning of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and more, just goes to show that social media uh, services are looking to clamp down even harder on what they see as right policy and wrong policy. And, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, you can't really tell a private company what freedom of speech is because the freedom of speech or the First Amendment only protects you against the government violating your right to free speech, not private industry. There's uh, Section 230, the changes are coming, how that's going to shake out, we really don't know, but still, at the same time, very, very uh, confusing. But, everyone, hey, uh, that's about it for today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow on the show, we have the one, the only, Mr. Ralph Bond. He is our, uh, he is our resident uh, science and tech correspondent, and we're looking forward to that. Everyone, we'll catch you next time. Bye.